ratified in order uh, to take it to Congress, um, which said that 38 state states um, need to ratify in order for it to be an amendment to the Constitution. You may have to repeat some of that because the live stream was having issues. Oh, gosh. So I'm sorry. The live stream was having issues. So let me tell you again that <laughs> sorry tonight's about program that. <laughs> is about the Equal Rights Amendment. We are going to um, have our, our guest tonight, Eileen Davis of Women Matter, who is a guru. Yes. Um, with, as far as equal rights goes, and one of the major leaders of the equal rights ratification in the state of Virginia. Um, she will join us later in the broadcast, um, and we'll be able to ask her some questions and um, get her input um, on the Equal Rights Amendment. So right now, uh, we're short one state um, for to have the number of states that we need for ratification um, and so that Congress uh, can take it up as an amendment to the Constitution. Currently, 37 states have ratified. We're looking for one more, and Virginia is one of them. Um, of course, I'm sure we all know that the Equal Rights uh, stands, Amendment stands for Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Last, well, the week before last, or maybe two weeks ago, Illinois law lawmakers approved the Equal Rights Amendment. Woo! Um, go Illinois! A long proposed addition to the United States Constitution that would ensure equal rights to all Americans regardless of sex. You would think that 230 years after ratifying its constitution, the U.S. would have some sort of federal protection like this enshrined, enshrined in its supreme law. But it has languished in Congress um, since 1923. First introduced into the Senate in 1923 and the House three days later, it has been the subject of hearings since February 1924. After decades of debate, it was passed by both the House and the Senate in 1972, but for an amendment to be added to the Constitution, a minimum of 38 states have to sign off. By the time the deadline for ratification passed in 1982, approvals had slowed to a trickle and stopped short of the magic number. Recently, with the rise of the Me Too uh, movement and Time's Up movements, there has been renewed interest in passing the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, again, Illinois recently uh, passing it um, in their General Assembly. So as we watch women's rights being rolled back again and again, understand that without a place in the Constitution, we will never be able to safeguard the gains that we make. And we see that in all different ways with... Um, um, birth control restrictions, abortion restrictions, uh, equal pay, um, violence against women, uh, the punishments that come with uh, rape, sexual assault, domestic violence. The fact that someone who's committed any one of these crimes would still be allowed to possess a firearm is ludicrous. Uh, not all states allow that, but a majority of them do. Um, the laws need to be stricter. And um, by having ensuring uh, that we um, do have stricter laws, we need the Equal Rights Amendment to pass in yeah. uh, Virginia. And um, we need it ratified um, in our, amended in our constitution. Um, so legislation alone cannot guarantee protection against gender discrimination. And so that is why we need the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, again, uh, we went over at the beginning of the show that Virginia is not one of the states that has ratified. Uh, the Senate has passed it uh, several times, I think five or six, but it's never allowed out of the subcommittee in the House. So um, what does that tell us? Voting matters. Absolutely. Um, despite a vigorous effort by women's rights advocates, um, a push to pass the IRA in Virginia died in the state legislature in February. Similar uh, efforts also failed this year in Arizona and Florida. 
And let's look at the states that have not ratified. It won't be a shocker to you. Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Nevada, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Utah, and Virginia. Yep. So. Yeah. We've got work to do, but I feel that this is definitely a doable thing because, number one, all those flipped seats last year, and we have seen Republicans, especially with the last Medicaid expansion vote, we saw Republicans choose to vote with Democrats for Republicans, including Jill Vogel, who just ran for lieutenant governor with Ed Gillespie, the, you know, last fall. And she actually flipped her vote from being against Medicaid expansion for the past three years. They voted on it, and she flipped and voted for Medicaid expansion for the first time ever. I think we have Republicans that are definitely feeling the heat, that they are realizing, you know what? Virginia is changing. The Virginia voters, and looking at the election results last night when I did my show, Mercury Rising, we had a three-hour primary (laughs) election results show. Um, It was really interesting on the uh, Virginia elections page. You could go in either the Republican side or the Democrat side, and we were tracking all the votes in all the, the primary seats. And looking at principalities, you could look at the city or the counties and how the percentages of votes broke down. And it, 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 I mean, I'm a nerd that way. So I look at these, you know, the votes. And for example, up in District 10, where Barbara Comstock was primaried, um, they put up another Republican to run against her last night. She won, but not nearly by the margin you would have expected sad it well yeah it is sad because she is considered at this point by the republican party and what they are currently standing for she is a very moderate republican whereas probably even three years ago two years ago maybe she would have been more to the right definitely considered more to the right of center. So yeah. And, and she won with almost 61%, not quite 61% of her district in district 10. And we're talking Loudoun County and out toward Winchester, which you still got a lot of farms. You still got a lot of rural voters in her district. So it, the landscape is definitely changing. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep it changing. Right. So it, it is, you know, and, and then seeing at the sort of the last 10% of that Republican Senate vote coming in last night, Corey Stewart just edged out of the 1% margin for a recount with Nick. I don't know if it's Fritas or Fritas. I've heard mm-hmm. it both ways. Sure. So, um, you know, and that I know a lot of people are disappointed about that today. Both Republican friends of mine and Democratic friends of mine. Um, simply because of his, what he stands for. Sure. That that's, you know, that's hard for Virginians all over to swallow that. That there's going to be someone on a major congressional ticket running with his out loud and proud Racism. White, white supremacy. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. So let's move on to, to other things. Because yes. we've got a lot to talk about before Eileen gets on the phone. And it's 713. We do. Yeah. So, so the ERA. What yes. is the ERA, Leslie? The For ERA, anybody tuning in that doesn't know. The ERA is the Equal Rights Amendment. Yes. And when was it written? Have- Has it been 100 years was it 1918, Alice Paul? Is it 100 years this year, I think? It's close. So it's close. actually 230 years after ratifying the Constitution. We still don't have it enshrined. Right. Well, right. Um, so, yeah. yes, uh, 1923 is oh, 23. when. 23, okay. Mm-hmm. It was introduced in Congress. But I'd rather Senate. not have to be saying 
Isn't it great we're finally getting the ERA in the Constitution 100 years after it was written? No, I don't want to have to hit that mic, that mark. No, no. No. <laughs> Let's get it before. <laughs> Let's do that. So the history of women's equality, the struggle for women's, the women's vote was won in infinitesimally small steps, both in mm, England yes. and America. Curiously, British women got the right to stand for Parliament in 1918 mm. before they even had the vote. And American women won the right to vote in 1920. British women won it in 1928. Uh, if we think about um, the history of the suffrage movement, um, it started... <laughs> as a polite deba debate, but activists soon realized that they would have to battle fiercely to achieve anything, and many died before they saw the success. Um, Alice Paul, who fought for suffrage in the United States and the, the UK, was a Quaker who went to England to study social work, and there she met uh, Christabel Pankhurst, Emmeline's Pankhurst's daughter, um, Radicalized by her experience in Britain, she came to understand that American suffrage would only come after a similar great struggle. Uh, founder of the National Women's Party in America, she was among the first to recognize that without an Equal Rights Amendment, suffrage was not a complete victory. Women had to be protected by the Constitution. Since they were not, a constitutional amendment was necessary. First, suffrage had to be won. In 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott convened a meeting of 300 women and men to demand justice for women at the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls. A proposal to push women's right to vote was passed after Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton made impassioned speeches. It's important to know that Frederick Douglass, the only Afri African-American president, was a staunch advocate of female suffrage. At, after the end of the Civil War, Stanton, Anthony, and Sojourner Truth fought to have women included in the new constitutional amendments giving rights to former slaves. The 14th Amendment defined citizens as all poor persons born or naturalized in the United States and guaranteed equal protection of the laws. But when Susan B. Anthony went to the polls in 1872, and cast a ballot in the presidential election, she was arrested, tried, and convicted of a crime. In 1875, the Supreme Court in Minor versus Happersett said that while women may be citizens, all citizens were not necessarily voters, and therefore states were not required to let women vote. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony continued to campaign for a voting rights amendment for women but they both died be before achieving their aim. Under the direction of Carrie Chapman Catt, the National Women's Suffrage Association created by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony became an important lobbying force from 1900 to 1920. Meanwhile, Alice Paul developed the National Women's Party into a small radical group that by 1916 had begun the process of making the fight for women's right to vote visible and inevitable. In 1919, the 19th Amendment, affirming the right of women to vote, had been ratified by about half the states. Then came serious resistance from states' rights advocates, the liquor lobby, mm -hmm. and a number of women who believed that the amendment would threaten the family. Oh, yeah. We see that now, too. Oh, yes. With regards to women's oh, yes. equality and rights. Well, that, and, that's the... Uh, yeah. That's the point used. That was the big argument back in the 70s when it was originally in Congress, right? Was that it was if women had all these rights, they wouldn't want to be at home being little Mothers. Susie Homemaker, June Cleaver. They wouldn't want to be June Cleaver if they could have all these rights. They'd be out, you know, being um, liberated. Oh, no. <laughs> No, we just want to be able to know that we have protection under the Constitution. And we know that that's not true. Women exactly. are able to multitask. They're Absolutely. able to work a full-time job. You know what I say parent. all the time? 
there was no such word as multitasking until men had to do more than one thing at a time. All right, the phone's ringing. I'm going to get that. Um, so as we go on about the history of um, equality for women in the United States, um, the anti-suffrage forces did not prevail. The 19th Amendment providing for female suffrage, suffrage was passed by Congress on June 14th, 1919. In the summer of 1920, Harry Byrne, a 24-year-old state legislature, legislator in Tennessee switched his vote from no to yes because his mother had encouraged him to vote for suffrage. Finally, on August 26, 1920, the right of women to vote was confirmed. We celebrate women's suffrage on Women's Equality, Equality Day every August 26. The vote is not enough. Customs, prejudices, and sexism do not disappear so fast. Um, this is why we need the Equal Rights Amendment um, in our Constitution. Um, I also want to talk about a little bit about um, black women and the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, <clears throat> as the women's suffrage movement gained popularity through the 19th century, African-American women were increasingly marginalized. African-American women dealt not only with the sexism of being with, withheld the vote, but also the racism of white suffragists. The struggle for the vote did not end with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. In some southern, southern states, African-American women were unable to freely exercise their right to vote up until the 1960s, which wasn't all that long ago. Uh, the racism that defined the early 20th century made it so black women were oppressed from every side, first for their status as women and then again for their race. Mm -hmm. Many politically engaged African-American women were primarily invested in matters of racial equality with suffrage later materializing as a secondary goal. The Seneca Falls Convention, widely lauded as the first women's rights convention, is often considered the precursor to the racial schism within the women's suffrage movement. The Seneca Falls Dec Declaration put forth a political analysis of the condition of upper class married women but did not address the struggles of working class white women or black women. So well into the 20th century, a pattern emerged of segregated political activism as black and white women organized separately due to class and racial tensions within the overall movement and a fundamental difference in movement goals and political consciousness. Black women engaged in multi-pronged activism as they did not often separate the goal of obtaining the franchise from other goals, which is interesting because it's all linked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most black women who supported the expansion of the franchise sought to better the lives of black women alongside black men and children, which radically set them apart from their white counterparts. While white women were focused on obtaining the franchise, black women sought the betterment of their communities overall rather than their individual betterment exclusively as women. In Women, Race, and Class, Angela Davis explains that black women were equal to their men in the oppression they suffered, and they resisted slavery with a passion equal to their men's, which highlights the source of their more holistic activism. So unfortunately, uh, the two different women's movements, National Women's Suffrage Association and American Women's Suffrage mm -hmm. Association, merged from the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and they began to support the cause. Its members realized that the exclusion of African-American women would, would gain greater support, resulting in the adoption of a more narrow view of women's suffrage than had been previously asserted. Uh, NAWSA focused on enfranchisement solely for white women. Sad, sad. Mm. The National Women's Suffrage Association considered the Northeastern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs to be a liability to the association due to Southern white women's attitudes towards black women getting the vote. Southern whites feared Afri African Americans gaining more political advantage and thus, and thus more power African-American women voters would help to achieve this change. 
Um, In her 1867 speech at the American Equal Rights Association, Sojourner Truth argued that giving black men the right to vote without affording black women the same right only promoted black men's dominance. And she said, I feel that if I have to answer for the deeds done in my body just as much as a man, I have the right to have just as much as a man. Mm -hmm. There is a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about the colored women. And if colored men get their rights and not colored women theirs, you see, the colored men will be masters over the women, and it will be just as bad as it was before. So that's really important to point that out. Um, yeah. There have, um, I wish Tanisha was here to talk about that more with us tonight, but I'm hoping that I somewhat covered um, the point of view yeah. <laughs> from an African American um, history level right. as far as women's suffrage goes. Well, and I think we still see evidence of that currently when we see the pay inequality of when uh, women make only so much, and I know Eileen will speak to that, about um, how much women make to when, a, uh, when for every dollar a man makes in salary, women only make so many cents. 79, and I believe. Typically. That's white women. But that's white women, mm-hmm. yes. So women of different ethnicities, and I do believe it is African-American women or some people. And Latinas. Are, right. But I think that, that people, um, African-American women, are the ones that make the least amount. And it's something like 66 cents or 64 cents on I'm the dollar. I'm sure I think it has is. those she stats probably does. for us. And um, she is on the phone yay. when you're ready. Well, I'd like to introduce one more thing okay. um, with regards to the Equal Rights Amendment. Okay, um, great. So, uh, Lucretia Mott um, Alice Paul introducing, introduced something she called the Lucretia Mott Amendment. It's so simple and appropriate that it's hard to anticipate any objection. Men and women shall have equal rights in every place in the United States that is subject to its jurisdiction. It took until 1940 for the Republican and Democratic parties to add the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment, to their platforms. The proposed amendment now reads equality of rights under the law shall not be abridged, denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. And let's point, let me also say what Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, talked about. The equality principle is not in the original constitution. The equal protection clause shows up in the 14th amendment which is a a restriction on what states can do. The court incorporated an equality principle into the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. But I suppose the best reason is if you look at any constitution that has been written since 1950, you will find in it a statement that men and women are equal before, before the law. So I have three granddaughters. I would like to be able to take out of my pocket constitution and say, the equal citizenship stature of men and women is fundamental tenet of our society, like free speech. The women's equal right to do what, whatever her talent and hard work enable her to do, and I'd like this to be in the Constitution. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our guest tonight, Eileen Davis with Women Matter. Um, we have some questions for her, and we just want her to uh, talk to us about the Equal Rights Amendment, um, what's happened in the state of Virginia, um, and ask her a few questions. Hi, Eileen. Hello, Eileen. Can you hear us? Hello? Hello? Can you hear us? Hello? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. There she is. Welcome, Eileen Davis of Women Matter. Thank you. Thank you. I was listening to what you were saying, Leslie, and I've already got um, I've, I've already got a couple of talking points to dovetail off of the things that you said. Great. But um, um, to begin with, I do have the updated stats on facts about the wage gap that just came out from the National Women's Law Center. Um, uh, I've got bad news and I've got good news. Um, the, the good news is that black women went up a penny in pay. And the bad news is Latina women went down a penny in pay. 
and women went to 80 cent white women went to 80 cents so women white women got a two cent raise black women got a one cent raise latina women lost a, a penny so right now we're at 80 cents for women for white women 63 cents for black women 54 cents for latina women 57 cents uh, and Native women, 57 cents, which means Native women, Native American women, are actually making more than Latina women. So that's, that's the stuff that just came out. I got this about a week ago from Representative Jackie Spears, uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spears, who is the uh, congressional sponsor of uh, a bill in uh, Congress to remove the ratification deadline so that we can ratify the final state without any court challenge and be done with it. So I wanted to start with that. Great. Um, thank you for giving us the updated um, stats. Uh, I want to ask you a question because we're talking about the Equal Rights Amendment and what it means for women in the United States. I'm sorry. Um, I lost with... you again. Remember, you have to talk to this phone, but stay on the mic as well. So it's a challenge. Okay, Eileen, can you hear me? Yes. I okay. Can hear you. Okay. With the recent passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in Illinois, uh, what does uh -huh. that what does that mean for women in the USA, and what is the next step? Well, we're down to the last day, and that is an interesting place to be in because we are literally at the precipice. Um, the one thing that has happened is that the people that were pushing for a complete start over have now said, well, no, now we're down to one state. We're pushing for the final state. Why? If you can't get one state, why do you think you're going to get 50? So we're down to one state. Now, the question is, which state is it going to be? Now, it's important to remember that Virginia is the only state that has half ratified. We have ratified in the Senate with bipartisan support five times. And we get stonewalled in the House of Delegates, and they won't even take it out of committee, even though on this last session, by patrons alone signed on to the bill, we knew if it went to the floor, it was going to pass. So it would have passed this year if they hadn't literally killed it in committee purposefully to obstruct the process. But something really interesting happened this year. On May 11th, Attorney General Herring, after last year's uh, fight, we had such a big mess, and they and the uh, Senate Rules Committee refused to hear the bill and said that the archivist of the United States said they couldn't. Well, the interesting thing is the archivist of the United States is actually a glorified librarian. He is not a lawyer. And I say he because he happens to be a man. And they quoted him that said they love to do it, but they can't because the archivist of the United States says they can't. Well, interestingly enough, um, one of our activists who works as a docent at the Library of Congress, um, National Archives, rather, excuse me, went up there and, you know, and kind of asked him. And he also got a letter sent from an activist in North Carolina going, explain yourself. And he wrote a very pointed letter back that said, I never did that. I never told them they couldn't do that. That's not my place to do that. It's not, I'm not a lawyer. It's not my place to tell the General Assembly what they can and cannot do. And I don't want to be involved or use as an excuse. So after that, it was a whole big mess about how the Senate had you know, purposefully misdirected and they didn't hold a legitimate hearing and they were making stuff up and the archivist was mad and the activists are mad and the advocates are mad and the sponsors are mad. Well, interestingly enough, Senator Black decided that the easy way to do this, which is kind of funny, that he thought that he would ask our attorney general to put the question to bed, thinking that the attorney general was going to say, nope, you can't do it. Well, interestingly enough, the attorney general said, yes, you can. On May 11th, Attorney General Mark Herring put out a decision where he said, and I probably could open it on my computer if you want me to, but it says, um, and basically in the conclusion, it says that the, um, that the ratification deadline does not disempower the Virginia General Assembly from acting. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't stop them. It's a separation of powers issue. In addition, Congress is completely within its uh, roles and power to when presented with ratified states to remove or extend the deadline and let it go through. And basically, he, in the, his conclusion was there was absolutely no reason why you can't do it. If the General Assembly wants to do it, they should do it, and then Congress will do its job. So everybody just do their job and stop equivocating. Now, the interesting thing is, is this is the same Mark Herring that refused to take the same-sex marriage case in Virginia because he said it was unconstitutional. He wasn't going to litigate 
because remember the attorney general's job is to be the lawyer for the state. And he said, I'm not taking the case. I am not going to argue the delegitimate, that's a delegitimation, legitimate, that's a big word, of um, same-sex marriage because I don't think it's constitutional to do so. And then it went to the Supreme Court and same-sex marriage passed. Yeah. And then secondly, Mark Herring is the same attorney general that went up to Dulles Airport and filed an injunction when the Trump administration was, <clears throat> was, was decided to implement that travel ban last year at Dulles Airport. So um, one of the um, people in elected official department said, well, frankly, it's not really going to sway them because they are, you know, the Republicans are not exactly, you know, fond of Mark Herring and his decision. So they're just going to think about as much of this decision as they do of his refusal to take the same sex marriage case and his re and his injunction against Dulles banning Muslims from seven countries, I believe it was, from entering in the United States just because they were coming from those seven countries without cause, based on nothing but their religious affiliation. So what this all means, I, you know, it's, it's who knows? It depends on the mood of the General Assembly next year. Now, the one thing that I think is that I believe that there is a historical intersection going on here. The interesting thing is, is that the um, Bill of Rights was passed in the Virginia General Assembly on December 17, 1791. And it said all men are created equal, but we know that it meant white landowning men only. Now, as you were saying, um, we have through time corrected the white landowning men to being first all men, all white men, regardless of their financial footing. And then it was rolled into black men and brown men. And then the last group to get in was women, um, white and black. But, of course, the black women were still Jim Crowed out of their franchise of voting. So, but we are, we have, now we have all of the, that kind of roll-in of rights and that roll-in of inequality um, because the, equal right to, the right to vote is the only constitutional right that is extended to women because the gender is excluded from all other rights. All other rights are not in the Constitution. And this is about the time that somebody will say, but what about the 14th and 15th Amendment? Well, again, you quoted Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and um, I have additional quotes for her. But I would also like to point out that um, Justice Scalia, who inadvertently gave us an amazing quote, he was asked by a law student, it's important to remember that Lily Ledbetter's original petition went to the Supreme Court, and she was turned away. And the Lily Ledbetter Act, frankly, is a consolation prize, because we were so mad that they went, well, better do something, because now the women are noticing that they have not been represented, and they can't even take a wage and inequality act to the Supreme Court. So let's, let's throw something at them to calm them down. So they gave us the Lily Ledbetter Act, which is a really highly useless 9% success rate bill that puts all uh, intermediate law that puts all of the responsibility of your of your rights for equal pay on the woman you've got to find somebody that'll find a lawyer to, it's just it's just it's it's a consolation prize and it doesn't even come close to filling the constitutional gap that got Lily Ledbetter turned away mm -hmm. but a law student asks uh, Scalia why he um, wrote the, the opinion that turned her away and he quoted and his quote is the Constitution is not whether the Constitution, the question is not whether the Constitution requires discrimination based on gender or sex. He used the word sex, but sex and gender is, you know, an interchangeable term from the time period. The question is whether it prohibits it. It doesn't. He went on to say, nobody ever voted for that, and you can't just reinterpret it in, meaning you can't just say that they kind of meant 14 to 15. No, they didn't. They never intended it. If you remember the woman, the movie Lincoln, when they were like, What's next? Votes for women? They were like upset about giving rights to black men because they really thought the next step, the next, which was a bridge too far, would be rights for women. So they never intended for women to kind of sort of be really included. And then he went on to say, said, so nobody ever voted for that. And then he went on to say, if, if indeed society has come to a different view, there is a process for that to get an amendment. So he's telling us, the gender is not an enshrined constitutional sub, sub it's the only class of human that is not recognized at this point in time by the Constitution. So he's telling us, and the interesting thing is, is that people, that's only one guy. No, 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 no. First of all, Ginsburg agrees with, 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 with him. And in addition, there were five people on that bill that turned Lily Ledbetter away. 
The only one, and the only one who's dead is Scalia. The other four men, and I say men because they were all men, who turned her away and agreed that she did not have a right to demand peg equality based on her gender, they're still sitting on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So we know that we've got five people on the Supreme Court that know that gender equality is not in one by Ruth Bader Ginsburg's words, and the other four by their history of voting against such things as Lily Ledbetter's petition. Mm -hmm. So that's it right there. So we know that every time a case goes to the Supreme Court that we cannot expect a you know woman's right um, to be equal to that of a man's. And indeed, the Women of Walmart case is a, is a, is a more recent example of that. So does that answer your question? Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Walmart um, case and when? Well, the interesting thing about the women of Walmart case is that was the largest um, pay uh, inequality uh, challenge ever filed by in the United States, and it was roughly about it was over two thousand women. And the interesting thing is that the woman who filed the suit was the primary filer. Her name was Betty Duke, and Betty Duke was an African American woman, and that's important because she didn't file as a woman of color; she filed as a woman. And they were in the group, in the class action suit. There were white women, brown women, uh, you know, women of all ethnicity. So it wasn't a it wasn't a racial question. It was a gender question. One thing that all of the complainants shared was their gender. And when it went to the when it when it was under considered, now you know, the Supreme Court process is that first they have to decide if they're going to take a case. And the reason that they take a case is they have to answer the question: What constitutional principle is being violated? Well, gender equality is not a constitutional principle, so no case is ever going to be taken at the Supreme Court based on constitutional, gen, constitutional gender equality because that simply isn't a constitutional right. So, but they knew it was a big um, case, and they knew it was going to be huge, and they knew there would be a lot of blowback if they turned it down, so they decided to put it in under the Commerce Clause because Walmart's the largest employer in the United States, and it's all 50 states, and they thought, okay, we're going to put it under the Commerce Clause. Well, the women of Walmart case failed at the Supreme Court, and guess why it failed? They didn't. They didn't. The only thing they had to answer is: was it a violation of the Commerce Clause? It was not a violation of the Commerce Clause because it didn't belong there. So it failed because it was ruled not a violation of the Commerce Clause. Whether or not it was a violation of the quality of equal pay, that was never addressed because that's not a constitutional question that needed to be answered. So there have been over 200 cases that have come before the Supreme Court that have been turned away because there's nothing to um, to um, take care of it. And we saw that in the Ruth Bader Ginsburg movie, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, championed for it, and she just kind of went around and started putting all those laws in place. And the laws are great, but we got to remember that the Constitution supports laws. You know, the Constitution supports laws. I mean, we've got uh, we've got a um, constitutional amendment that says you cannot discriminate based on, you know, race, religion, or national origin, okay? And that's a constitutional principle, which means that any complaints made get the strict constitutional scrutiny. Gender does not get strict constitutional. Any complaint made based on gender does not get constitutional scrutiny. Matter of fact, you're lucky if they don't just turn you away. But what happened was we had the 14th and 15th Amendment to address race, and then, all those years later, the Jim, Crow, you know, the, the Civil Rights Act came in to address Jim Crow, and the Civil Rights Act sat on top of the pre-existing 14th and 15th Amendment. And you talked about that a little earlier about how we got those amendments, but they really, you know, rights didn't really come until the Civil Rights Act. Now, if they had passed the Civil Rights Act without the 14th and 15th Amendment, guess what? Civil Rights Act would have been just that. That act would have been just as hollow as all the rights we have, like Lily Ledbetter, and though they would be just as hollow. The point of the matter is the Civil Rights Act sits on the constitutional equality of race, religion, and national origin. And that's the strict scrutiny. That's the foundation that the Civil Rights Act sits on. The interesting thing is that we've passed all these intermediate acts, but we're not none of those acts are sitting on a constitutional foundation, which means is while we pile up all these acts, we're not addressing the fact that only the Constitution conveys constitutional rights. And without the constitutional principle, all the intermediate laws are just that intermediate. They are not the platinum standard constitutional. And that's for all women. That's for all women. Oh, I'm sorry. My, I have a call coming in. I don't have a 
stop it. Hold on. <laughs> and, and, okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> now that you've... Uh-oh. We lost Eileen for a minute. I'm yeah, sure the, she'll call she back. She probably will call back. Um, so we'll get As her I moment. said earlier, <laughs> Eileen is an equal rights amendment guru, and we heard that with everything she just explained to Absolutely. us um, regarding the Equal Rights Amendment, yes. how all of the laws that are in place to protect women really have no teeth unless we have an amendment to our Constitution. Yes. Um, so it doesn't matter if we have, uh, you know, Lily Ledbetter Act, Equal Pay Act, um, any kind of law that is um, supposedly protecting women without the Equal Rights Amendment in place um, in our Constitution, none of those laws really can have any effect. Um, and what Eileen let us know is that as people take um, their cases to the That's Supreme okay. Court, they the are to turned away um, because we don't have the teeth of... Um, our rights in the Constitution of the United States. So, um, Eileen, I want to... Hold on. I don't have her yet. Okay, we're getting Eileen Davis back with Women Matter, who is um, helping us understand how important it is to have the Equal Rights Amendment in the U.S. Constitution. Um, we've already talked about how we need one more state to ratify, so we'll have 38 states and... Uh, then there should be no reason why we can't have that amendment to the Constitution. Eileen, once we do have uh, the... Uh, I'm sorry, I, just, I tried to stop the call coming in and I disconnected the call I was on. So once uh, we do have, Eileen, the uh, last remaining state to ratify, um, what are the next steps and how long will it take um, so that we can have equal... Uh, well, if you read the Equal Rights Amendment text, it says that um, it will be Equal Rights Amendment takes takes uh, power two years after it's ratified. So what happens is there are two years for all of the um, existing laws to come into compliance with an Equal Rights Amendment. And that's interesting because in the 70s when they thought it was going to pass, they actually, um, I, there's a gentleman who was in the military whose job was to you know, gender equal the, the um, military, and his job was to do that. And he said it was actually very easy. And a lot of, and he saw a lot of really good policies being put in place, expecting the Equal Rights Amendment to come into place. And then when it failed, they just stopped all of that stuff, and women literally got like thrown off of the ladder that they're now on. He said it was really remarkable. So, um, but I, I did want to go back, if you will indulge me, I did want to go back to what you were talking about with diversity, because I think diversity is a really important issue, and I, and I wanted to share a few things with you, and, and I think that um, when you're talking about equality and you talk about the intersectionality of, of, of race and economic status, I think it's like everything else, equality, the lack of constitutional equality hits um, the less privileged the hardest. The list. And that's, you know, that's the intersectionality question. And, and I, I think that the thing is, is that, yeah, we do have a history of, of racial animus, which actually goes back earlier than, um, than you discussed. It goes all the way back to the Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass, because originally the 14th Amendment was supposed to include women, and they had to pull it out because they wouldn't pass it. So women were pulled out, and it went through, and a lot of the suffragettes and a lot of the most of them were Quakers who fought so hard for, uh, you know, the abolitionists. They wanted that. They wanted that. They wanted the rights for free, you know, slaves, and they also wanted the rights for women. They felt it all groups. And then when they didn't get it, that was really that was rough. But again, when we look at history, dividing marginalized groups has always been a key activity of the people in power that are trying. They they, they don't want the the people that don't have power to come together. Like if they can keep, they can keep, you know, free plays fighting with white women. If they can feel, if we can have black women and white women and brown women, you know, angling and jockeying and fighting amongst ourselves about what, you know, 
the what does it do for me, what does it do for you, it, it ends up not doing anything for anybody. And then I think that we can look to Georgia. The movement in Georgia to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment is, is all women of color, run by a woman named, her name is Reverend Shirley. She's a black woman, and she is a phenom. And I've been on several calls with her, and we've had many conversations about the need for intersectionality. We need diversity in this movement. We absolutely need diversity in this movement. And we have a, quite a history of, of diversity in this movement. Um, you know, Shirley Chisholm back in the 70s was a huge proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment. As a matter of fact, one of the, um, I have a copy of her speech right here. She gave a speech on the floor of Congress when the bill was being considered for a vote in 1972. And uh, and her, if you will indulge me, I will, this is Shirley Chisholm, who is amazing, and by the way, the, the first black woman to run for president. Uh, Mr. Speaker, House Joint Resolution 264 before us today, which provides for equality in the law for both men and women, represents one of the most clear-cut opportunities we are likely to have to declare our faith in the principles that shaped our Constitution. It provides a legal basis for attack on the most subtle, most pervasive, and most institutional form, institutionalized forms of prejudice that exist. Discrimination against women solely on the basis of their sex, is so widespread that it seems to many persons normal, natural, and right. This amendment is necessary to clarify countless ambiguities and inconsistencies in our legal system. For instance, the, the Constitution guarantees due process of law in the 5th and 14th Amendment, but the applica applicability of due process of sex distinctions is not clear. Representative Shirley Chisholm. And then she, and in back in this, this 1976, 60% of black women and 63% of black men were in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, legislation was supported by the NAACP, the National Council of Negro Women, Coalition of Black Trade, Unionists, National Association of Business, of Negro Business, and the National Black Feminist Movement. So since then, somehow it's been, that narrative has gotten has gotten pushed away. And by the way, that, that what I just read to you was put together by Andrea Miller, a woman who runs an organization and is very involved with um, intersectional issues and, and, and works with the NAACP. So that was something that I got together with her on to get. So I think that the, the message is, is that intentional, in, intersectional, intentional intersectional feminism is the only way we, we've got to do it. We've got to recognize that all women need to be pulling the rope in the same direction that's because right. that's going to help all of us. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an old white lady. Mm -hmm. Equal rights women, frankly, doesn't do that much for me. It doesn't change my life. But if I'm a young black woman who isn't getting paid right, you know, she's got a lot more to gain from a ratified equal rights amendment than I do. I'm fighting for it because it's the right thing to do. And I've got grandkids and I, you know, and I just, I just, I feel like I need to use my privilege to do what's right. And doing this, I believe, is the right thing to do. Um, I wanted to ask you um, in the same light um, to explain to our listeners, and we just have a little bit of time left. Um, if mm -hmm. you could uh, briefly explain uh, what um, CEDAW is. Um, which Oh, CEDAW is an interesting thing. CEDAW stands for the Council for the, Discrimin the Elimination of Discrimination Against All Women. And the CEDAW is an international women, better known as the International Women's Treaty. And the interesting thing is that the CEDAW Treaty, if a country signs the CEDAW Treaty, they must have a, a clause of equality for gender, i.e. sex, in their country's constitution. We made Afghanistan put one in their in their constitution when they every every country since World War II that had their countries rebuilt and the United States meddled in it required a, a equal rights amendment for gender in their constitutions. But China has it in their constitution. Now the interesting thing is a lot of these countries choose to ignore their constitution. You know they don't they have a constitution they just choose to ignore it. And you know there are some that would say we're moving in that direction ourselves. But, because, but the, we do not have it in our Constitution, which means that we can't sign the CEDAW Treaty. And we haven't signed it, and there are only five states, that have, five countries that haven't signed it. And there's Somalia and Palau and Topongo and Iran 
no place that you would ever live and the United States. And it's an absolute international embarrassment to consider that, you know, the powers that be are so entrenched in not sharing equality with women that they would rather stand with five countries that have some of the most largest human rights abuses in the world because they don't want to have to put any a gender equality clause into our constitution. And the interesting thing is it only requires Senate approval. So it would be the, it would be the quickest way to get it done, but we can't even get that done. So what I would end with, cause you said we have a limited amount of time. One of the things that I have found in, in, in my work in, and cause when I first started this, Leslie, you know, I thought that it would be, we, you know, I moved to Virginia. It was an unratified state. I'm like, oh, I'm going to bring this to their attention. And they're going to say, oh, great, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Gee, this is an I Like Puppies bill. We'll pass this. We'll have a press conference. We'll pat ourselves on the back. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be inoculated in saying we're not fair to women, and we can move on. Uh, boy, was I wrong. And it's taken me a long time. I always get this question every session. Well, if it's so, if it's so simple, why hasn't it passed yet? And I always look at them and say, that's the one question I can't answer. You're going to have to explain to me what your resistance is based on. Because it really is, it's 24 words. It's really, and it's exactly the same as the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment said the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged. And the, what was supposed to be the 20th Amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment, also written by Alice Ball, says equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any other state. She thought it was going to be part A and part B. Get the vote in and then pull the rest of the equality in with the 20th Amendment. It never happened. So my point is, is that we have, when, I, when I'm trying to deal with the resistance, I've come to understand that when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Let me say that again. When you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And, and on, conversely, when you're used to being mistreated, when somebody tries to offer you equality, there is a there's a sense of well I don't get it what's 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 what am I not missing what am I missing there's a certain and I understand it there's a certain skepticism and I get that and I and I think that we're at an inflection point in our in our in our female community where we we really need to we're 51 percent of the vote if we could just pull our power together we really could have what you know what we deserve as 51 percent of the population. And, and I would also say the interesting thing is, is Nevada was the first state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in just in like what, 30 years, 40 years, I don't know, 40 years, whatever. It was ratified in 45 years of the day, 45 years of the day. It was ratified on March 22nd, 1972, and it was uh, Nevada ratified on March 22nd of 17. So it was 45 years of the day. But the interesting thing is, is that what happened is Nevada reached a critical mass was 40% of its legislature were women. And as soon as we had 40% of the, of the and, and by the way, the bill in Nevada was championed by a black woman named Patricia Spearman, who was actually originally from Petersburg, Virginia, and went to Hampton University. And she will, she will tell anybody who listens why this bill does more for communities of color than it does for any other community. And she it sets her hair on fire when somebody tries to say that it doesn't help minority communities and it doesn't help black and brown women because it absolutely does and it helps black and brown women more than any other group by the numbers and as well as it also has effects on domestic violence violence against women title nine title seven all of it um the way that women are treated in the court systems all of it um you know even something as insane as, as the the menstrual equity you know you know, women have to pay for their own menstrual products, but meanwhile, nobody ever charges you for toilet paper because even though it's a biological function, women are not treated equally. I mean, it's from, it's from the, from the, it's on all areas. You can, you can look all day long and find a reason why equality, the lack of constitutional equality, and you can't take a bill like, you can't take a complaint like that to the Supreme Court because you don't have a case because there's no gender equality to complain about. So what I really would like to say is that I think that we are at an inflection point where we have got to, and you know, Leslie, the original name of our group is Women Matter, Use Your Power. That's right. And Women Matter, Use Your Power. We, as women, need to come together and, you know, and take, our, take our, um, our, our majority. Because when the women in Nevada did that, they said, okay, what if we neglected? The first thing they did was the Equal Rights Amendment. Because when you get enough women making decisions, you, know, you don't have to spend half your time telling old grandpas because I, when I talk to a male legislator, I spend half of the 15 minutes they allot me making them understand that there really is an issue to be addressed. 
I can walk into the most recalcitrant woman, regardless of her party, and I don't have to explain to her that gender inequality exists. She will acknowledge it right from the go-get, but then tell me why doing an Equal Rights Amendment, she can't do it, mostly because she doesn't want to get men in her party mad at her or in her coalition mad at her. It's mostly because she can't convince the boys that it's necessary. So that's a whole nother source of, of complete and utter, you know, just frustration to the ninth degree. So Eileen, I want to thank you for everything that you've shared with our listeners tonight. Uh, I, our time is up. Um, I think we'll have to have you on again. Um, so we can continue this conversation. In in the meantime, can I give a plug, go to women matter.org. It's an online library. You can sign up under contact. You can read up on the issues. It's all there. There's a, a milieu of information. And we have and it if in I the am comments. Stuck, so I do come back, uh, do a little homework and call them with a great question. How's that? Great. Thank you, Eileen. All right. Thank you, Leslie, for having me on. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. And we do have that link to the womenmatter.org. Uh, page listed in the comments of our Facebook Live. But of course, it is women-matter.org, and that is in the greater Richmond, Virginia area. Um, and so, yes, and so I'll let you do your wrap. Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for tuning in to Her Human Equal Rights with the focus on her. Uh, join us in two weeks from now. Uh, to for another program, and we will have Tanisha back. Um, we'll put up our um, topic in the coming days um, so you can tune in, and hopefully we'll have more time for people to call in and ask questions. And that'll be on the 27th yes. of June. All right, great. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Again, this is 8.01 p.m. on Wednesday, June 13th, and you are tuned in to WRWK 93.9 FM, licensed to Midlothian, and serving Powhatan, Goochland, Henrico, Chesterfield, and the greater Richmond area and beyond through the power of the inter uh, interwebs, uh, for better, for a better term. Um, we do have a link posted in the comments also for our new online streaming. Please give us feedback on our Facebook page, The Work FM, and at our website, theworkfm.org, O-R-G. If you are interested in volunteering with Low Power FM Radio, you can contact us at both of those online locations or call into the studio and leave us a message locally at 804-464-1089. We are completely volunteer uh, operated, run all the shows, all the hosts, nobody is getting paid. So if you do make a donation through our online avenues, every single penny goes to keep us up and running. We're going to take it out with a little bit of Tracy Chapman and talking about a revolution and we want a revolution for the ERA. So thanks for tuning in tonight, and we will be back on the air live in the morning at 11 a.m. with Lisa Nell and her show, RVA Business Babes, which is all about focusing on women-owned and operated businesses in the greater Richmond area. So tune in for that, 11 on Thursday mornings. And then we have our Sunday night show, 8 o'clock, The End of an Era with Herschel Stratego. Talking about a revolution sounds Don't you know Talking about a revolution sounds While they're standing in the open lines Crying at the doorsteps of those armies of salvation Wasting time in the unemployed lines Sitting around Waiting for a promotion.